All right, good morning, and welcome to Matins on this Saturday of the fifth week after Epiphany. Thank you for being with me today. Our psalm for today is going to be number 149. Uh, we'll finish Isaiah chapter 61, and catch the first couple verses of chapter 62, and we'll read uh, from 2 Timothy chapter 4. So before we get into the word, let's pray that God would help us to stay focused on him. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Psalm 149. Hallelujah! Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise in the congregation of the faithful. Let Israel rejoice in his Maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their King. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praise to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure with his people and adorns the poor with victory. Let the faithful rejoice in triumph. Let them be joyful on their beds. Let the praises of God be in their throat and a two-edged sword in their hand to wreak vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings in chains and their nobles with links of iron, to inflict on them the judgment decreed. This is glory for all his faithful people. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Lord, let Israel rejoice in you and acknowledge you as creator and redeemer. In your loving kindness, embrace us now that we may proclaim the wonderful truths of salvation with your saints in glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> okay. So we're going to start with Isaiah chapter 61. We'll pick up where we left off yesterday with verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for my soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth bring f brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations 
shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is from Second Timothy chapter 4, and we'll read verses 1 through 8. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who art eternally both merciful and just, be thou our God, and that not in our way, but in thy way. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Every day will I praise you and praise your name forever and ever. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave and crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Let us pray. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome in adversity, and in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. (coughs) Okay. So, if you remember from yesterday, chapter 61 is titled, The Year of the Lord's Favor. And so we have this this description, this first half of the Redeemer of Israel bringing those among Israel who are penitent, bringing them out of darkness and into, into his light the darkness of sin. And that's what the first part of this has been talking about. Um, yeah. And the last bit we, we read yesterday talked about um, their offspring shall be known among the nations. So he's talking about the future um, of, of the children of Israel who will enjoy the Lord's favor. Um I will greatly rejoice rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Okay. So, um, our understanding of righteousness is that on Judgment Day, when we're all resurrected, and I think I've said this before, I don't know if all of you have been here with me remember this, but... Standing in front of the judgment, the, the, the judge on the, on the last day, we will be covered in our own, our, our robes, if you will, will be stained with our sin because we are not righteous. But Jesus' righteousness will be thrown over us like a cloak. We'll be covered by his righteousness so that the judge will look only at Jesus' perfect, pure, radiant righteousness and will not see the stain of our sin. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Okay? And then it it makes some comparisons here. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress. In those 613 laws in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, right? There are very specific descriptions of 
what the priest should wear when he goes in to deal with the Ark of the Covenant and to go into the Holy of Holies. The, the adornment that they would go through is just elaborate. So when he says, like a priest with a beautiful headdress, it's, <laughs> if you've ever watched me put on my robes, it doesn't compare. I mean, we have some beautiful vestments here for me to wear for our, for, for our rites of worship, but nothing like what they used to have. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, right? Um, so listen to this. Um, Listen to this description here. Those whom the Lord wraps in this robe of salvation, this robe of righteousness, not only experience deliverance from unrighteousness, but also power to live out his righteousness. <laughs> we are released from our captivity to sin. And then this, this priestly headdress, it says the only other times this is mentioned in, in Isaiah are in uh, verse 3 of this chapter, 61, and in chapter 3. That's it. Isaiah doesn't talk about it anywhere else. Interesting. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts... And as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up. Joy is guaranteed. Joy is guaranteed. Just as the earth is guaranteed to cause seeds sown in it to sprout. If nature is reliable, how much more so is God? So that's the end of chapter 61. Let's read a little bit of the summary here. So the servant Messiah will come, bringing good news and everlasting joy to the redeemed of Israel. As broken-hearted souls, we must confess the sinful cause of our poverty and brokenness. Our dire straits are due to our sinful condition, a condition from which we cannot free ourselves, which we confess every week, right? Jesus brings liberty for all held captive by sin and death. By his death and resurrection, he has delivered us from the shame of our sin clothed us in his own righteousness and made us to be his holy priests. All of us, huh? Hmm. All right. And then we got the first five verses of chapter 62. All right. So this chapter, proof of God's willingness to send his enlightening word into the souls of people again and again. The way to glory is again presented as leading through Israel's release from the Babylonian exile to a salvation proclaimed to the end of the earth. And that's one we haven't read yet. That's in verse 11, but that's okay. The envisioned scene is a panoramic view of a new Jerusalem. Its walls encircle the entire earth. The new Jerusalem, right? Um, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch, I will not keep silent. Okay, in the darkness of Satan's dungeon... The eyes of his captives do not see the glory of the Lord. But the Lord's word gives light and the vision of faith, enabling the blind prisoners to see the door to liberty unbarred. Hmm. The nations shall see your righteousness. So Zion becomes the city of righteousness only by the mouth of the Lord. Hmm. Uh, and you shall be given you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. A mark of God's blessings throughout Scripture that demonstrates a change in status or character. Right? So Jerusalem will become Zion. Um, Jacob became Israel. Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Saul became Paul. Right? Um, that is one of the ways that God shows us that he has blessed an individual by changing their name, right? All right. Uh, you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. Royal scepters may have been topped with a crown. And that's what a diadem means, a crown. 
All right. Now, you shall, excuse me, no more be termed forsaken. And forsaken has a capital F at the beginning of it. And your land shall no more be termed desolate with a capital D. All right. If God had not taken pity on his fallen creatures, their fate would have been like that of an unfaithful wife, abandoned by her husband to live out her days amid the ruins of her wrecked life. However, the servant lived and died to effect a reconciliation. Okay, this is not, <laughs> this is not, this is the kind of verse of commentary that um, some people find terribly offensive. This, you have to think of it in the context of this time. In this day and age, women did not work. Women had to be married. The husband worked and brought home what was needed to sustain the household, and the woman kept the household. It was, that was the model of the society of the time. So when a woman's husband died, or heaven forbid he divorced her, or he abandoned her, she, had, she was penniless. There was nothing. That's just how their society was. It's not a commentary on where women belong, okay? That's how this worked in these days. So, they're using that to describe what would happen. You shall no more be termed forsaken. Your land shall no more be termed desolate. That's, that was the fate of Israel when they were, when, when God turned, when they, you know, when they turned away from God and he left them to their own devices, that's how they felt. They felt forsaken. The land was desolate. But now you shall be called, my delight is in her. Hmm. That is actually the name of Hezekiah's wife. My delight is in her. And your land married. That's with a capital M. It's a formal name. God puts, him, puts upon himself and Israel, the bonds of marriage, which he will not break, despite Israel's unfaithfulness. That's quite a bond. All right. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. So the Hebrew verb here means to take possession of a woman in marriage. Surviving sons of Israel will again claim Zion and the promised land. Okay, again, think about it in their context. Don't, don't get offended by it. That's how it worked in those days. This is Isaiah. This is centuries before Christ. Okay. And that's where we stop for the day. Okay. All right. Let's put that on hold and we'll come back to that next week all right second timothy this is the last chapter yes all right preach the word i charge you in the presence of god and of christ jesus who is the judge who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom i charge you preach the word quite a charge right this is possibly recalling Timothy's ordination vow. Paul now summarizes the duties of Timothy's office by giving him this command. Preach the word. Um, Paul has spoken the charge, but Christ will judge Timothy's faithfulness on the last day. Right? In Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearance in his kingdom. So, yeah, Paul's telling him, but it's ultimately Christ who's going to measure him. Um, by his appearing and his kingdom, Christ's return and judgment will fully reveal the kingdom he established by his suffering and death, in which Timothy now works as a pastor. Yeah, don't think I'm not reading this passage closely. Um, by his appearing and his kingdom. In other words, this is not an earthly kingdom, but one that is ruled by Christ, not just earthly. Sorry, I forgot to mute my computer. All right, verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Okay, this verse contains the simplest summary 
of every pastoral duty and responsibility, administering the sacraments, admonishing the erring, that is, those who err in their ways, E-R-R, and comforting and visiting those in need. And all of these flow from the preaching of the word. Right? Um, you might have heard that saying that that they usually attribute to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the word at all times. Use Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. He didn't actually say that, but I like it. In season and out of season. In other words, all the time. All the time. There is no season when the gospel is not to be preached. Reprove. That means to persuade by showing evidence. What's that evidence? God's word. Rebuke. That is to speak God's condemning law to those who err. The erring. E-R-R-I-N-G. It is the pastor's job to say, hey, you're doing something that's not in accordance with God's word. Well, what is that? Well, violating God's law somehow. It's supposed to be my job to point that out as a pastor. It's supposed to be my job. It's supposed to be Timothy's job to tell people, hey, I saw you steal in the store the other day. That does not please God. You need to make that right, and you need to confess it. Whatever that, and whatever that thing is, whatever that sin is, it's my job to point it out. Think that's hard? Hmm. Exhort. Comfort. That means to comfort the penitent sinner with the gospel. Okay, so if God's law convicts us, we read God's law, thou shalt not steal. And we read that, and it gives us a guilty conscience. That's good. Then in our despair, because that's what being convicted does to us, in our despair, it's my job then to say, and despite your sin, Jesus took that sin to the cross and paid the price so that you can be forgiven and be saved. That's also my job. I don't just tell you it's not right. I also tell you you're forgiven if you ask forgiveness and you repent and confess your sin. See? All right. To comfort the penitent sinner with the gospel. That is what it means to exhort. With complete patience and teaching. Literally, the translation here literally is long-suffering and doctrine. Doctrine, that is the teachings of the scriptures, is the pastor's only tool for reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. Yet, doctrine must be taught with long-suffering, knowing that people will not always accept what is taught, or that acceptance might take a long time. I still have to do it. All right, now here's my favorite verse out of this whole thing, just because it seems so prophetic. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, you think? But having itching ears, in other words, desiring to hear something new and entertaining, because, you know, the gospel is boring. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, teachers who only tell them what they want to hear rather than what God declares in his word, teachers who tell them what they want to hear, prosperity gospel. I'm sorry, this is probably going to offend somebody. Joel Osteen, prosperity gospel. What he preaches is not what this says. <clears throat> and there have been others like him, charlatans who've made millions as televangelists. And that's not me being jealous of him, okay? That's me telling you, listen to what the Word says. 
get get the word of God and understand it so you can figure out who these false teachers are. <coughs> but we we don't want to be told our nature doesn't want to be told that we're sinful. We want to be told that we're basically good. We want to hear that God loves us. Yeah, he does. He does love us. The amazing thing is, is that he loves us in spite of our sin. He doesn't love us because, well, we're trying to be good people. That's not why he loves us. He loves us because he created us. He loves us so much. He, he created us so that he could love us. And when he found out how unlovable we were, he saved us from that too. That's the amazing part of God's love. But we don't hear that amazing part if we're not also told that we're sinners. If we're not, if we are not also, if it's not pointed out to us what it is that makes us unlovable. It's one thing to say God loves you, but that's not nearly as amazing as you are unlovable and God loves you anyway. That's the amazing thing about the gospel. Okay, and that's why this verse is so important to me. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, to tell them what they want to hear. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. All right, it gives me a reference here to 1 Timothy. I just want to check that out real fast. 1 Timothy 4, sorry, 1 Timothy 1, verse 4. 1 Timothy 1, verse 4 says, uh, This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Nope. That's 2, 4. Excuse me. Fits, but that's not what I was supposed to read. Sorry. All right. Remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Okay. Myths are fictitious, legendary stories that are of no spiritual value. Oh, we know that. Okay. but So he's already been telling Timothy this. There are other teachers teaching myths in this church. So he's trying to save them from that. Be, all right. As for you, always be sober-minded, be aware and focused of the task on the task at hand. <clears throat> Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Okay. An evangelist, that word literally means one who proclaims the good news. Fulfill your ministry. Rather than being swept away, along with those mentioned in the previous verses, Timothy must faithfully pursue his service. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Okay. This is an allusion to the Old Testament sacrificial system. Paul regards his eventual death, that is the pouring out of his blood, as an offering to Christ. Drink offering. Uh, and the time of my departure has come, which is a reference to Paul's death, which he believes is coming near. I have fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. This could refer to remaining personally in the faith that God has given and or guarding Christian doctrine against false teaching and error, which we know Paul did. All right. Uh, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, that is, eternal life. The justified are due the crown because of the promise. Saints should know this promise, not that they may labor for their own profit, for they ought to labor for God's glory, but saints should know I should know it, so they may not despair in troubles. So you need to know you're baptized. You believe in Jesus as your Savior. You have eternal life. You need to know that. That's where our hope is. They should know God's will, that God desires to aid, to deliver, and to protect them. This is from the Lutheran Confessions, specifically the Apology. Uh, which will... the which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, 
course, Paul means judgment day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Probably a reference to the Christians on longing for the last day, but it might also refer to Christ's incarnation. We're not sure. All right, quick summary. Faced with the thought of his imminent death, Paul impresses upon Timothy the importance of carrying on where Paul will leave off, preaching the word faithfully. We should not judge our pastor's preaching on whether they say the things we personally like to hear. It's not my job to preach to you what you want to hear. We should judge preaching instead on God's word. God's word sometimes cuts like a knife when it exposes our skin. Yes, it does. But after the law comes, the gospel of peace, binding up the wounds inflicted by the law with the sweet gospel, which proclaims Christ's forgiveness for all our sins. If you hear the law from me, you should also hear the gospel. And if you don't, you need to tell me, because it is my job to preach both. Okay, that's a good place to stop. Would you please pray with me? <clears throat> Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom which comes down from heaven, that your word may not be bound, but have free course, and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name may abide to the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the Almighty and merciful Lord the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless and preserve you. Amen. Okay, that concludes Matins for this Saturday. Thank you for starting your day with God and for giving back to him a little bit of the day he's given to you. I'm hopeful that uh, the weather will not <laughs> uh, do to us what it has done the last two weeks, so I hope I can see some of you in our sanctuary tomorrow. Uh, if not, I'll see you back here. Oh, that's I, I beg your pardon. I have jury duty next week. <laughs> so I may not have the ability to do videos for us. So um, I won't know until sometime Monday. But um, at the very least, I will post the readings. And that way you can at least keep up with the readings. But... Either way, we'll do something next week. So um, I look forward to being with you again whenever that is. And whenever it is, until then, may God bless and keep you. <laughs>